Club of Portland's Friday Forum. I am Colin Jones, President-elect of City Club. For more than a century, City of Club of Portland is where civic-minded people work together to make Portland, Oregon a better place for everyone to live and explore. We're gathered today at Portland Community College in Southeast Portland and are joined by thousands of Oregonians via X-Ray FM's radio stations, KGW's website, Facebook feed and news app, and Open Signal's community media television station. In addition to the City Club's valued media partners, our sponsors enable us to put on the state's best civic programs week after week. Thank you to the Portland Business Alliance for your generous support of the city, of the city events this week. Everyone, please join me in showing your appreciation. I'd now like to invite Mark Mitsui, president of Portland Community College, to the stage. He'll introduce Faith Hawkins, a student at Lincoln High School, who will then introduce the mayor. Thank you, actually, it's my pleasure to be able to introduce to you our board chair at Portland Community College, Ms. Kali Thornlad. Good morning. Good morning. How is everyone today? Wonderful. Uh, I have the pleasure of welcoming you to the beautiful PCC Southeast Campus. As uh, President Mitsui said, I'm chair of the Portland Community College Board of Directors, but I'd like to recognize a couple of my board colleagues who are also here today, um, Director Michael Sonleitner and our student director, uh, Kian. So PCC's campuses and centers are unique and remarkable. Each one of them has its own character and serves as a beacon of opportunity for our community. The Southeast campus is particularly special as it has become an anchor institution in this vibrant city. And as many of you may know, we have recently expanded this campus to make it an official what was first a center is now a campus. The ca woohoo! <laughs> I love it. The campus serves over 12,000 students annually, and in the majority of these students identify as non-white. And we think that this is the first comprehensive pu public post-secondary campus um, in Oregon with this distinction. So that's worthy of a round of applause. Um, this newly expanded campus, you'll also see um, there are many LEED certified buildings because PCC honors and sees the importance of sustainability, and we've tried to do that with all of our campuses. We also have a number of workforce programs that come out of this campus and were developed here initially. Among the many offerings, there are things associated with STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, and math. Particularly noteworthy are the indoor and outdoor maker spaces. If you haven't seen them, they're incredible, worth checking out. We also have career and technical programs and several different efforts to create a pipeline of, um, for underrepresented students to jobs that are living wage jobs. I think <laughs> the enthusiasm is great. <laughs> I think the most important aspect of this campus, though, is the authentic connection it has to the community here. Um, as many of you know, Southeast Portland and 82nd is a diverse community, representing many cultures internationally and locally. And we try to stay connected to this community. And you see that when you hear. You see it with the people that are teaching here. You see it with the people that work here. And you certainly see it with the students here. The city of Portland, it continues to be a tremendous partner to PCC. We're particularly proud of our partnership with the Future Connect Scholarship Program. Um, yes. <laughs> Future Connect has served over a thousand students over the last few years. And if it weren't for the partnership with the city of Portland, it would not be possible. Our Future Connect students are seeing greater outcomes than other students in school. They are first generation college students that are not just entering PCC, but they're completing and they're getting a post-secondary degree and they're going on to jobs. And that's largely because of this partnership between PCC and the city of Portland. So thank you for that. At Portland Community College, we deeply appreciate the work and the commitment of Mayor Wheeler, who has been a supporter and an advocate of the college for many years. Thank you, Mayor Wheeler, for your advocacy, for your commitment to equity, for your commitment to the 
future of this city through the students of Portland and across the entire region. And as we talk about students, it's my great honor to be able to introduce a student that we have here today. Her name is Faith Pockin, and I'll allow her to come to the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Wheeler, for inviting and participating in this event today. It's a huge honor to be a representative of my generation. My name is Faith Pockin, and I'm a junior at Lincoln High School, which is also Mayor Wheeler's alma mater. I started Lincoln High's Never Again Club, Students for Safer Schools, that helped organize a student tribute last month, last month which Mayor Wheeler attended. The tribute involved 17 desks lined up with the names of the 17 victims from Stoneman Douglas High attached to the front. Students brought dozens of flowers and notes to put on these desks and over 300 students participated. We sat in silence for 17 minutes in respect of the victims and wrote letters that were later sent to Parkland. After the tribute, middle, middle and high school students from around the city rallied to City Hall. We shared our thoughts and ideas with the mayor and he encouraged us to continue our fight for common sense gun laws. And that's exactly what we plan on doing. <laughs> A few weekends ago, Portland area students hosted the March for Our Lives event with thousands of students, parents, teachers, and supporters attended. Last week, students hosted the town hall urging state legislators to make demands for increased gun control measures, and we have future events planned on a national level. In a time where the federal government has abandoned us, it has become clear to take this matter into our own hands. This is a student movement, but we need your help to make this happen. Thank you, Mayor, for your support. The most important leader thing a leader can do is show up. And the Mayor, Ted Wheeler, shows up. <laughs> Thank you again for helping us amplify our voices. We plan to continue our fight, and we will not give up. I now have the privilege of introducing the 53rd Mayor of the City of Portland, Oregon, Mayor Ted Wheeler. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what, if I was a good politician, I'd say, thank you, Faith, for those inspirational words, and then I'd stop and I'd leave. <laughs> and we'd all leave inspired and confident in the future of this city. So thank you, Faith, for that tremendous introduction. Kelly, thank you for your continued leadership in this community, Mark, thank you for your incredible and visionary leadership of PCC. Faith, I, I can't say this again, uh, and I can't say it enough. We're all inspired by your leadership, so thank you. And we're inspired by the work of your generation and your peers to shape your not only uh, country, but also uh, you just give me great confidence in the future of this community. So thank you for, again, underscoring that this city has a very, very bright future. So we were very intentional in our decision to move today's address from the traditional downtown location to East Portland to a place where young people are preparing for their futures. And uh, again, I want to thank uh, President Mark Mitsuini. I want to thank college campus president, Dr. Jessica Howard. She's our campus president here for allowing us to have this event here today. And to those of you who are watching or listening, and I want to particularly call out one individual, my spouse, Katrina, uh, I don't know why you put up with me. <laughs> I'm glad you do. And uh, I can't tell you how much I love and appreciate you and the support that you give me that enables me to have this opportunity to be a leader in our community. And I want to thank <laughs> my colleagues in government, honored guests, and all the residents of this really incredible and amazing city. As I address you today on the state of the city, I am also going to ask you to join me 
in an examination of our current moment, the bigger picture, if you will. At a time when young people like Faith are really pushing society forward, government seems to consistently find itself two or three steps behind the public that it's supposed to serve. And this happens at all levels of government, but let's consider for a moment the state of affairs in Washington, D.C. And promise, I promise, I will bring this back to local government, but let's just for a moment consider Washington, D.C. As Faith indicated, overwhelming majorities of Americans are in support and have been for many years of common sense gun legislation, and yet Congress chooses to do nothing. And Faith, I was honored to stand with you and your peers at Lincoln High School as you demanded change on that front. Most Americans believe that immigrants strengthen this country, and yet the rhetoric from Washington, D.C. continues to divide us. And large majorities of Americans understand that climate change is real and that it is harmful to our environment and harmful to humanity, and yet the administration continues to retreat from commitments that were made long ago in support of global action on climate change. Cities like Portland cannot afford to wait for Washington, D.C. We can't afford to wait for anyone to act on our behalf. We have to take this moment into our own hands. We have to seize the opportunity to secure our own future according to our own vision and according to our own values. That's what my speech is largely about today. I also want to say this. I believe this city is very fortunate to be represented by a city council that understands the historical importance of this moment. I want to thank my colleagues who are here and this is in order of seniority, Commissioner Dan Saltzman, Commissioner Nick Fish, Commissioner Amanda Fritz, Commissioner Chloe Udaly. We're different people. We have different experiences. We bring different things to the table. We disagree. We disagree often, but we disagree agreeably. And there is not a day that goes by that I am not honored to serve as a member of this council. Thank you to our bureau directors and our city employees who dedicate the majority of their working lives to help make this community a better place to everyone. And there is, believe it or not, a sixth elected official in the city of Portland who does not get the credit that she deserves, and that's our city auditor, Mary Hull Caballero. And, <laughs> and she may be the most popular elected official in the city. <laughs> She works with us effectively to ensure transparency and accountability. And Madam Auditor, I'm, I'm really honored to be able to work with you. During this last year, Portland cemented its longstanding reputation as a leader. And in cases where Washington isn't delivering, I'm very proud of the fact that the city of Portland has been delivering. And we've been working with other leaders from municipal governments around the region and around the country to fill the void where leadership needs to be provided. We're considered a global leader on many issues, among them combating climate change. I recently had the opportunity to hold a press conference in Chicago with Rahm Emanuel, Anne Hidalgo, who's the mayor of Paris, the mayors of Vancouver, British Columbia, Montreal, and my friend, the late Ed Lee, the former mayor of the city of San Francisco. And we represented over 300 cities around the globe who are recommitting and doubling down on our efforts to support climate action under the Paris Climate Accords, even as our federal government steps away from prior promises. I was proud to tell these leaders about the great things that have been done 
in Portland, Oregon, and in Multnomah County. I was thrilled to watch as people responded to the truth that our climate emissions, our carbon emissions have actually declined by 21% below 1990 levels, even as our economy has grown, even as our population has ballooned. And I was very proud to tell them about our recent commitments to work together on the path towards 100% renewable energy in Portland, Oregon, and Multnomah County by the year 2050. <laughs> Portland, thank you. Portland is also demonstrating to the, to the nation and to the world, that we are a city that will continue to be open and welcoming and inclusive for everyone, regardless of their immigration status. We have, <laughs> we, my colleagues on the city council, we have repeatedly reaffirmed our status as a sanctuary city. And we've challenged the Trump administration in court to protect our ability to do so. And frankly, I cannot believe that in the year 2018, there are still high level administration officials who believe that mayors like me and other like-minded elected leaders around this country should be arrested for supporting our immigrant communities. I will continue and my colleagues will continue to fight for our right to be an inclusive, welcoming city. And yes, for me that means even if I have to go to jail. This is a hill, this is a hill, I am asked often, Ted, what hills are you willing to die on? This is one of them. Make no mistake about it. We are a pluralistic society. Immigrants have always been, and they will always be central to the fabric of this society, and we must defend it. Moreover, I want to make this crystal clear. I know there's a lot of people who disagree with me and disagree with my colleagues on this. I want to be crystal clear. We are abiding by the law. We are defending the U.S. Constitution, and every well, I think there was one, so I will say virtually every federal court that has ruled on this matter has agreed with us and disagreed with the administration. Our national and international leadership, folks, it's needed today more than ever. We cannot step away or shirk our responsibilities. And in Portland, as in other cities around the nation, cities are stepping to the fore and they are leading. This is an important change. Why? Because the majority of Americans live in cities. According to the last census, 80% of Americans now live in cities. That's where the population is. That's where the voice is. We're fragmented because we're all over the place. We come from different walks of life, different parts of the country. Uh, we have different makeups, different politics, but collectively we have a voice that is much stronger than what's going on in Washington, D.C. And I felt like this year in particular, cities woke up to that reality. As the trend towards growing cities continues, Portland happens to be one of the fastest growing cities in the United States. More than 100 people move to the city every day. That's a couple of TriMet busloads of people who come here every single day. There's a good narrative to be told. And again this week, Portland made the short list of cities that are considered amongst the most desirable in the United States to live. That's no surprise to any of us, we all know that. Uh, people are moving here because along with our natural beauty, and I'm of course referring to the environment, not to me, <laughs> maybe some of you, but along with our natural beauty, they like the attributes, they like the quirkiness, they like our beer, they like our restaurant culture, they like our coffee, they like our donuts, they like the fact that we're entrepreneurial and creative in feel, they like our maker spaces, and yes, they're also moving here for economic reasons. 
the Seattle Times, otherwise known as the Shelbyville News, recently called Portland's economy transformational. Forbes, yes, you heard that right, Forbes called Portland the number one city in the United States for careers and for business. And the list goes on and on. I think it's important that we remind ourselves from time to time. Let's face it, we're Portlanders. We're hard on ourselves. We hold ourselves to a very high standard. We're hard on ourselves. Let's pull back for a minute and just be grateful for many of the things that are working well, that are working right in this city. The things that we love about the city, the things that rightly draw people from all over the world and all over the country to want to locate here. But of course, this being Portland, there is another side to the story, and we have to talk about it. The challenges associated with growth being right up there near the top. If Metro is right, and I'm you know, not going to get into debate about their statistics, but let's assume they are right based on the number of people moving here. In the years ahead, there will be hundreds of thousands of more people living in the city of Portland and the surrounding region. It raises some obvious questions. Where is everybody going to live? And will they be able to afford to live here? Will we be able to afford to live here? Are we going to have to leave? Where is everybody going to, where is everybody going to work? And will the people who are here now have the education and the job training required to qualify for the kinds of jobs that are being created in our community? Anybody who commutes already understands that traffic is horrific. How are we all going to get around as more and more people move here? We're not building more roads. We're not building more freeways. That isn't going to happen, so we have to think about that. And how do we leverage the full potential of increasing diversity? Those are key questions, seminal questions, which will drive the role of government today and in the years ahead. I have complete confidence that Portlanders are up to solving these challenges. And it won't be exclusively the work of government. It will not exclusively be the work of government to solve these challenges, no. It'll be the efforts of the people and the institutions in this community working alongside government that will cement our success. I'm confident of that. We know what the key challenges are facing us today. Homelessness, housing, having an effective and accountable police force, addressing long-standing shortfalls and being able to address our infrastructural needs, shared economic prosperity, and the list goes on and on. We have to recognize these challenges as an opportunity to put our values into action and to let them serve as an example for others. Food, shelter, water. Ever since antiquity, those have been identified as the essential elements to life. I believe that housing is a human right. I have said this time and time again. I believe everybody deserves a warm and dry and safe place to rest their head at night. We cannot continue to call ourselves a progressive city while so many people live and too many die on the streets of our city. We are experiencing nothing short of a humanitarian catastrophe on the streets of this city. It's unacceptable to me, and I know it is unacceptable to you. And I expect us to continue to lead and innovate and find humane solutions to addressing this significant problem, the problem of homelessness. And we all know this isn't just a Portland problem. I think in the last point in time count, LA had something like 65,000 people living on their streets. 
But I recently had the opportunity to convene the West Coast mayors. We were all meeting in Washington, D.C. for the U.S. Conference of Mayor. I convened the West Coast mayors, and we were there to talk about the issue of homelessness in particular. And I was really taken by the degree to which the other cities look to us for innovation. They look to us for inspiration. They look to us for leadership. And I think we need to grasp that opportunity to work with our colleagues and again show that we understand that the opportunity to lead is an opportunity that we cannot afford to pass by. That's why the first dollars that will be in my proposed budget, which I will release in the coming weeks. So by the way, if you've been reading about my budget plans, you don't know what my budget plans are. <laughs> they will be released. The chief thought that was funny. Thanks, chief. She's new. <laughs> but the first dollars in that budget will be dedicated to preventing homelessness, providing shelter for those who live outside in the elements, and most importantly, guiding people into permanent housing and getting them the help they need to get off and stay off the streets of our community. That said, unfortunately, the city of Portland, as I'm sure you're aware, has a challenging budget, and I've asked all our bureau directors to show me what a 5% reduction in services would look like. It's ugly. My commitment to you is this. We will maintain the record investments we've made in the Joint Office of Homeless Services. And I want to thank Chair Deborah Kafori for sharing a vision with me and seeing it through. The Joint Af Office of Homeless Services is probably the greatest collaboration between the city of Portland and Multnomah County ever conceived. And I'm energized by the opportunity to help lead that office to greater success in partnership with Chair Kafori. So thank you, Chair, for your strong leadership. I also want to point out what that partnership has led to in terms of results recently. The total shelter capacity in our community has actually doubled over the last couple of years. And I realize shelter is not ending homelessness, but shelter gets people out of the elements, out of the rain, out of the snow, out of the cold, and it gets them into at least the first stage of a stable environment where they can be connected to services that could get them into a permanent housing situation. During the last winter, we had 2,300 beds. That's significant because that's more capacity last winter than I committed to reaching by next winter. We're actually ahead in terms of numbers. And there has been a payback in results. We are one of the only cities in the United States of America that actually demonstrated through its point in time count that we had reduced the number of unsheltered homeless people living on our streets. It went down by 11%. Now, don't get me wrong. There's no champagne corks popping here. The problem of homelessness is very serious, and it is growing. But having fewer people living outside in the elements, that demonstrates that we can make progress on this important issue. We reduced our unsheltered population by increasing shelter capacity, by placing more people into permanent housing, and by reducing the number of people who become homeless in the first place. Almost 5,000 people obtained housing last year, hundreds more than the goal that the partners in a home for everyone set before the year began, and more than twice the number placed before the coalition was created. That's 5,000 people who are no longer living outside, no longer living in shelter, and they have a place to call home, 5,000. In addition, more than 6,000 people 
started receiving prevention services last more. That's almost 2,000 more than the year prior. That's 6,000 people who were right on the edge economically and in danger of becoming homeless who will not become homeless. 6,000 people. We know that homelessness is a challenge for our entire community. I get it. I hear the public. I get the cards. I get the emails. I get the calls. People approach me at the grocery store, on the treadmill. Heck, I'm afraid to take a bath anymore. <laughs> I hear people's frustration. I hear people's anger. But I got to tell you this, and this is what I tell people. If you're thinking, I'm going to solve this alone, or you're thinking, my colleagues and I are going to solve this alone, or if you think government writ large is going to solve this problem alone, you are going to be terribly disappointed. We're doing our part, and we're going to redouble our efforts the things that we can do and do well as government, but we cannot do it alone. So I've repeatedly called on the community to bring its ideas, its resources, all the expertise that this community has to offer to help us to address this serious problem amongst others. And you know what? Good news. The community is responding. The community is stepping up in important ways. Just last week, just this week actually, just yesterday, in fact, <laughs> now that I think about it, we announced a partner between the private sector, government, academia, and philanthropic organizations that will get people experiencing homelessness off the streets into a warm, dry place with water and sanitation and connect them with the help that they need to get off the streets. And what's unusual about this particular arrangement is we're not the ones standing by the microphone. The private sector is taking the lead with government as a key partner, but it's a private sector initiative. Thanks to a generous contribution, a one and a half million dollar personal contribution by Columbia Sportswear CEO, Tim Boyle, to the Harbor of Hope, this project is going to get off the ground. And I want to thank Tim Boyle. The plan is to create a shelter and a service navigation center adjacent to the Broadway Bridge on the west side of the river. It'll have room for more than 100 people, access to showers, laundry, bathroom facilities, and most importantly, it's going to connect people to the specific services they need based on their individual situation. As you need to know, people are homeless for a lot of different reasons. And to get an individual out of homelessness, it means they need to have a tailored solution that addresses their own specific needs. There is a need for this type of programming in virtually every corner of this city. In downtown specifically, and I believe this model will serve as a proof of concept that public-private partnerships can work effectively to help us address this problem. I know so many people around this city agree with me about the need. However, and this is my first ask, I'm already halfway through this speech, this is my first ask. We cannot support shelter but only if it's not in our own neighborhood. We cannot, we cannot support affordable housing, but say we don't want it next to us. We need to work together as a community. This is a community-wide problem. Do you agree with me on that? Thank you. Glad to hear that. As we make progress on homelessness, we also have to address the factors that lead to homelessness in the first place. We must ensure that Portland remains a city that's accessible and affordable for everyone. 
I don't want Portland to be a city where only millionaires can afford to live in the central city, and then the people who do work, like service industry employees, have to live half an hour, an hour, or two hours away and commute in. This is already happening in other cities on the West Coast. It isn't going to happen here. I want a city where we actively create housing options at every income level for people of all ages and all abilities. This is going to continue to be a real city, not a Disneyland for rich people. I have great confidence that my city council stands unified on this point. And some in recently, recent weeks may have confused the inherently messy and complicated decision-making process with the actual outcomes. Yes, design review is complicated. The appeals are even more complicated. The 2035 zoning plan is complicated. Land use hearings are complicated, and they have multiple steps. People confuse that necessarily and purposely designed process for the outcomes. I want to be very clear on this. Our city council has consistently voted at every opportunity for more housing, despite competing important other priorities and values. Housing is important. People are highly engaged around housing. Everybody has an opinion on how we should be approaching affordability. But I want to be clear about the results. The results are very positive, and we're using many tools to address housing affordability in our community. So what have we done? Annual production and permitting levels are higher than at any point during the last 15 years. In 2017, there were 14,000 units in the production pipeline, including the permits. What about affordable units, you may ask? More than 600 affordable units came online in 2017, more than double the number of units the prior year, double. And this year is already shaping up to be another record year. There are currently more than 700 newly affordable units under construction or slated to open in 2018, 700. But if you think that's exciting, guess what? In 2019, there will be over 1,300 units beginning construction and opening their doors in 2019. The 700 this year, that is the largest number of affordable units ever produced in the city of Portland in a single year in modern history. The city council... The City Council will soon approve a plan to allow for greater height and density in the central city to help create more housing, all of which will be subject to the Council's new inclusionary housing program. That alone has the potential to create thousands of units of workforce housing in our city. And if the city and the county work together, we have the opportunity to actually buy down to even lower levels of affordability, to very low levels uh, of, of income. Uh, potentially all the way down to zero, which is called permanent supportive housing, and we're very motivated to do that. We passed a new multi-program just last week and incentivized those with market rate developments in the pipeline to include affordable housing units in their project so that we can move more quickly to get affordability on the ground. And I urge our colleagues at Multnomah County. I know they're taking a good hard look at this. I'd like to encourage them to also pass the multi-program at the same levels that the city council did. We just launched a permitting pilot. You know, I've heard anecdotally people say, well, it takes too long, it costs too much, there's too much of a hassle factor associated with permitting. So I'm working with Chloe Udaly and others uh, on this permitting pilot. And what we are doing is we are looking at uh, projects that are of public significance in the community. Think things like schools, uh, commercial projects, housing projects, school projects, and we are fast-tracking them. We are asking our various permitting bureaus to put together a new 
fast track strategy. This is just the pilot. It's already showing early results. And we're going to take what we learned from that pilot and we're going to apply it more broadly to permitting in general. So that's exciting. We, of course, passed major tenant protections this year, including making permanent an existing policy requiring landlords to provide relocation assistance to tenants that they either evict without cause or who can't afford a double-digit rent increase in a single year. We also... We also expanded the pool of tenants who are eligible for this much needed protection. And we're investing the housing bond dollars that you all approved. This came from the community, the housing bond, $258 million to create 1,300 units at least of affordable housing. The goals were very clear in the ballot measure language. 1,300 units at least would be created within five to seven years. I feel the urgency. I understand why people want this housing built ASAP or purchased and protected ASAP. I get that. But I want you to know this. We are on track to accomplish and live up to the commitments of the ballot measure. As of today, we're only 18 months into this five to seven year time frame, and we nearly have half of the units promised to voters in the process already locked down both in new developments and acquisition of existing buildings, providing new housing opportunities and preventing displacement. But guess what? I'm not satisfied with this. I think it's good. I think it's positive. But it's not big enough. It's not scaled to the level to really move the needle in a way that we knew to move the needle. I went to the legislature during this last session, and I see Alyssa Kenny Geyer here. Uh, she championed this and others. Uh, I went to the legislature to seek the passage of a referral to the ballot of a constitutional amendment that would do something really exciting, but really boring sounding. That's right up my alley, right? It's right up my alley. It allows us to use our general obligation bonding capacity, think the housing bond, or if Metro does a housing bond, this could apply to them too. It allows us to use our general obligation bonding and leverage it with private sector and institutional dollars. If this constitutional amendment passes at the ballot, it could take our 1,300 units that were promised in the bond, and it could double or maybe even triple the number of units we could get with the same amount of dollars that were raised by the ballot measure. So here's my second ask. When this constitutional ballot measure comes to the ballot in November, I am asking you to vote for it so that the dollars we have in the public sector can be leveraged by private and philanthropic dollars to go farther. Will you support it? Yes. Thank you. While we address access and affordability in the rental market, we also have to create opportunities for home ownership. A home represents an opportunity to create intergenerational wealth, not just for families now, to be clear, but for families over the long term. I don't think these speeches should just be about things that are working. I think we need to be frank and talk about where we are falling short. And this is one area where we are falling short. The city council recently heard from the North Northeast Housing Oversight Committee, and the results were really disappointing, not just to me, but to my colleagues as well. We thought a program that's almost four years old would have resulted in more people with lower incomes, particularly people in North Northeast Portland, people of color, people whose families were originally displaced from home ownership opportunities. We thought more people would be connected with housing than the numbers of people that we already have. Why is this so important to me and to my colleagues? 
Housing is everything. If you think about all of the problems confronting our society, housing, if not being the primary answer, is at least one of the most important answers to how you solve that problem. Why? Housing anchors a family to a community. It's the anchor that holds you there. It's the place from where parents go to work to help create economic prosperity. It's the place from which kids go to school. And we all know that if kids have to move from one school to another school, and another school, and another school, and even in maybe a district or a new town, as their parents chase housing affordability, it disrupts their academic progress. And of course, kids who have lower incomes are more subject to this displacement. Housing connects families to community institutions. Think about the churches in the black community in Northeast Portland. Think about community organizations that rely on the presence of families. When you uproot those families, you uproot and destabilize those important community institutions as well. And finally, housing provides family with the opportunity to do the most important thing that a family can do which is spending time together. When you build and strengthen families, you build and strengthen communities. And housing is the key to all of that. Quote, we've come some of the way, not near all of it. There's much yet to do. Those were the words shared by President Lyndon B. Johnson 50 years ago yesterday. These words still ring true, and as we recognize the 50th anniversary of the 1968 Civil Rights Act, more commonly known as the Fair Housing Act, uh, I want us to remember that. I want to thank everybody here, the housing experts, the advocates, the people who work for community institutions. I, I saw Diane Lynn from Proud Ground here, uh, and, and many, many others. I want to thank you for your years of leadership trying to uh, make sure that we have housing choices for the most vulnerable people in our society. Thank you for that. Your energy and your creative creativity have always called into question whether our best actions really meet the best of our intentions. There is so much more left to do. And it's going to take a recommitment from all of us, all of us here, all of us in the city, to ensure that equal and fair housing accessibility exists for all Portlanders. We will deliver on our promises to the North Northeast Housing Oversight Committee. It will not be easy, it will not be quick, and it will not be cheap. But we're going to continue to work together as a community and try to realize the important values that were established when that program was created. In mentioning this, I want to be clear here. Portland has a very storied history of discriminatory practices that have eliminated housing opportunities for many of our brothers and sisters of color in this community. We know how de facto and de jure segregation and restrictive covenant practices have eliminated many of the housing choices that were available to Portland families over the decades. And we know that some of the very neighborhoods that the majority population enjoys and calls home today were created as a result of that legacy of lost opportunity, of lost wealth creation, and created an environment for a lack of trust. That lack of trust has to be owned, and it has to be acknowledged. And that means owning and acknowledging and putting the light of day on the history that led to that lack of trust. Until we do that in a forthright and honest and courageous manner, we cannot move on the way we want to move on as a community. So we have to do it. This gap can only be recognized if we take these important steps. I want you to join me in reaffirming reaffirming our commitment to fair housing for all. And 
I want to make sure that we lock together arm in arm, hand in hand, and move forward towards a reality that affirms our commitment to the intent of the Fair Housing Act, both in spirit and in practice. That intentionality around equity in housing also has to be within my goals around public safety. Here's the controversial part of the speech you've all been waiting for. <laughs> and I want to have a frank conversation about this. When I ran for mayor, I promised that I would conduct a national search for a new police chief one that would lead us to a more effective, accountable 21st century police bureau, one who would build trust within the community that the bureau serves, one who would put an increased emphasis on professionalism, training, and de-escalation strategies, one who understood the tensions many in our community feel about policing, police tactics, and the history of policing in our community one who would help us lift up and live up to the commitments under the Department of Justice Settlement Agreement, which I have committed to. One who could inspire and lead the next generation of the fine women and men who serve as police officers in the Portland Police Bureau. We conducted the search. But we didn't just go out and do it as though it was some sort of an HR exercise. No, we included community voices every single step of the way, and our search reflected the community's voice through surveys and focus groups. And by the way, those surveys and focus groups were designed such that we had over-representation from communities of color. That was intentional. We not only learned what the community wanted in a police chief, we also homed in on what the community expected law enforcement in this city to be. Side note, a national debate ensued over a single sentence, a single sentence that I put in a three-ish page long job description for the next police chief. What I said was that a successful police chief in our city has to understand and be prepared to address our own racist history and had to understand and be prepared to address the implications that it has for policing today. Who would have thought that would be controversial? But it was. It opened up something that was lurking there just beneath the surface, a very difficult and uncomfortable and challenging conversation that had to have, be had. Because just like policing in America is experiencing a transformation, policing in Portland has been and will continue to experience a transformation as well. Back to the surveys and the focus groups. What did you tell me? You told me that you wanted a police chief who is community and people oriented, first and foremost, who values diversity and understands the importance of community policing. You also told me that you wanted the next police chief to prioritize community engagement. In fact, throughout the survey, the community made it abundantly clear that its primary expectation of the Portland Police Bureau was community policing. The community made this demand. A few months ago, I welcomed our new police chief, Chief Daniel Outlaw. Thank you, Chief, for being here. She and I, and by the way, I am three quarters of the way through my speech, just in case you're wondering. She and I share a vision for community policing in Portland. You should know your neighborhood officer by name. Your neighborhood officer should partner with you in helping you to build your community. Our officers should be engaging youth through after-school activities and youth-based programs on a much more regular basis. 
Community policing and engagement can't be limited to just showing up for events. No, the police bureau can and should do a better job of informing all of us about their policies and their practices and their results. But it doesn't stop with the simple sharing of information either. The police bureau needs to collaborate with you. During the last year, I stood up six pilot community policing patrols, walking patrols in six neighborhoods in this city, all across the city. They were very well received, both by the police officers who got to participate in the patrols and the communities in which those patrols were located. You also need to have a say in what community policing in Portland really means, and that's why the Portland Committee on Community Engaged Policing is so important. For the first time, there will be a formal and direct collaboration between the police bureau and a city committee on policy development. This goes beyond what's in the settlement agreement and straight to the heart of what Portlanders have been demanding for many, many years. Yes, it's long overdue. I acknowledge that. So I will announce here today that the application for PSAP will be made available next Friday, April 20th. If you care about policing, if you care about this city, if you believe in the kinds of changes that I and the chief have directed and would like to see made, I encourage you to apply. Portland needs you. How the Portland Police Bureau carries out its duties also matters. Earlier I mentioned Portland's racist history and the implications for policing in the year 2018 and beyond. I expect all of our officers to be culturally competent and aware of their biases, just as I have biases, and all of you in this room and those watching and listening have biases. It is extra important that police officers understand those inherent biases when interacting with community members who aren't similar to them. Implicit bias training for officers is scheduled to begin next month. And it's going to include direct conversations with invited community members on their perceptions and on their experiences. I expect recruitment and hiring to be equitable to ensure that we're working towards an inclusive police force. In short, I expect equity to radiate throughout every part of the Portland Police Bureau. That's why I will include in my proposed budget funds that will support PPB's efforts to increase diversity in hiring and retention. And they're going to collect data, lots of it, and they're going to analyze it, and they're going to report it out to the community so that all of us can see what's going on. That includes stops data and making all of our decisions through an equity lens. This will not be easy. This will not be easy. There is a lot of work to do, but I know the chief, and I know I, and I know the city council, and I know the police bureau is up to this challenge. Staffing is a huge issue. This is a huge problem. Chief Outlaw leads a bureau with fewer officers today than they had a decade ago. And yet, the population of this city continues to increase, and the number of calls to 911 directed to the police bureau have increased dramatically. Dispatch calls for services increased by 25% in the last five years, up 97% just for stolen vehicle calls. Over the last five years, and here's the problem, the trend for total response time for all calls has increased significantly. For example, when the chief came to testify in front of the city council recently, she gave a single example, an active carjacking. That means a carjacking in progress gets called in to 911. The police always show up. I want you to know that. They're required to show up and respond to 911 calls. The question is, when do they do it? It took an hour and two minutes for the police to respond to an act of carjacking because they were spread so thinly. So to review, 
Police numbers are way down. Response time is way up. Calls are way up. And in fact, despite national trends, some crime statistics are also increasing rapidly in our own community. Person crimes, so that includes things like uh, assaults, homicides, sex offenses, they've increased and they continue to increase at a faster rate than last year. Property crimes have increased and they continue to increase at a rate faster than last year. We're seeing more fatal traffic collisions in addition to more injury collisions and hit and runs. Portland's population continues to grow, response time continues to increase, and it is irresponsible for any elected official to not respond to that reality. I don't care if you love the police or you hate the police. There is one truth that drives all of this, in my mind. When you pick up the phone because you or somebody you love is in crisis and you call 911, you expect the police to show up and you expect them to show up in a timely basis. And when they get there, you expect them to be professional and well-trained. You expect them to be well-rested and in a good state of mind. The police bureau has made very difficult and sometimes impossible choices that make it very, very hard for them to live up to this basic expectation in our community. And the data shows we are not living up to that basic expectation. The police are compensating, and here's where it gets really dicey. I told you they have to show up, right? It's required. The police are compensating for this lack of authorized personnel by working the ones they have longer and harder and they're using overtime funds to do it. This is very cost ineffective. It's a very expensive way to run a policing operation, and it leads to burnout. There is a reason that we don't allow firefighters or dock workers or airline pilots to work super long hours and get burned out. Why wouldn't this be true of the important role of policing as well? As police bounce from call to call to call, and that's what's happening right now. They're not getting out of their cars. They're not talking and engaging. They're going from call to call to call, and as they do that, they are not in the community getting to know the needs of the community. They're not building trust. They're not hearing from the people that they serve in the ways that they want. Folks, what we are doing today, it is the opposite of community policing. It is the opposite of community policing. The vision is to return to a full community policing model where officers are out of the cars, they're walking in every neighborhood, they're meeting residents, they're meeting business owners, they're attending neighborhood meetings and events, they're interacting with and building trust with the people that they are supposed to serve. The police work for you. They want this opportunity. I ask you, to support this plan. Getting back to a full community policing model, it is demonstrated. It will both reduce crime and it will build trust. And it is consistent with President Obama's 21st century policing model and it is consistent with the platform that I ran on when you elected me your mayor. Let us do it. As we think about the foundation of trust, it allows us to think about a future city that will give the next generation, people like Faith, and I believe every young person, an opportunity to connect to jobs and eventually to a career to support their economic prosperity. There are 30,000 people in this community between the ages of 16 and 24, 30,000 who have neither a job or Engaged in, are engaged in education, 30,000. We can do much better in this because this is a huge opportunity lost, not just for those young people, it's a huge opportunity lost for the entire community. And the high unemployment rates today in an almost zero employ, unemployment economy, we still have really high sticky unemployment rates for youth of color and low income youth. That is unacceptable 
It's terrible for them. It's terrible for their families. And it's terrible for the community at large. And Kelly, I am so proud of your Future Connect program and the great work you do. I'm proud of the work that my Council of Economic Advisors, who represents businesses large and small, working with work systems, working with our, our colleges and universities, working with Prosper Portland, are connecting youth. I'm proud of the Connect to Careers program. And this is one where we're going to connect youth, particularly youth of color, with employers who see this gap and want to close this gap. Connect to Careers is coming through the Council of Economic Advisors, and it'll be large, launched soon. Tomorrow, tomorrow, April 13th, over 40 employers, 30 community organizations, and hundreds of volunteers are going to join together for the inaugural Opportunity Youth Job Fair. And the city is very, very proud to be a major sponsor of this event as it strives to bring together those who will define our economic and future growth, and that's young people. And so I'm calling on businesses that are here, and I see a lot of business representatives in this room. I am calling you and calling on you to go through the Connect to Careers partnership as you employ young people in our community. Can you do that? Yes? Good. All right. So I want to get to the end because I, I feel like I've said the things that I need to say. I've loaded you up with lots of asks. As I look to the future, I'm hugely optimistic and energized by the promise of this community. I see a city of complete neighborhoods that includes housing and jobs and active transit and excellent schools and a wealth of community amenities. I see transportation infrastructure that responds both to the needs of today as well as the needs of the future, addressing how we're all going to get to around in an increasingly populated community, but also continuing to address our important climate action goals. We will leverage our understanding we have to think bigger picture about everything that we do at the local level. We have to understand that housing and education and economic prosperity, they're not separate buckets. They're all connected. And we have to pass policies and build coalitions that understand we have to think about these things at the same time. And it'll be a city where all women, including women of color, who make less than their white peers, make the same amount as men for doing the same work. We will be a community for people of all ages. Age-friendly cities recognize that we must strive to engage people civically, socially, and economically. I believe that age-friendly cities will be more desirable, successful, and economically viable than cities that are not age-friendly. And I'm hugely proud of the work that the Portland City Council has been doing and will continue to do to make Portland the number one age-friendly community in the United States of America. It goes without saying that our skyline will be redefined in the years ahead. The Broadway corridor and the post office site in Northeast, Zydell to the south, OMSI in the Rose Quarter on the east side of the river and central east side, uh, Gateway to the east, and many, many other development opportunities. And they all provide really exciting chances for us to catalyze housing and jobs and green spaces and urban habitat, river access, active transportation, and many, many other exciting opportunities. And you're going to hear about all of those separately in sequence. In conclusion, I'm optimistic, as I said, about our future. I'm optimistic about our future because I'm optimistic about our people. And I know that together, we absolutely will succeed as a community. Together, working in partnership, Portland's not going to just be the city that works. I am determined, and I believe we will succeed in being the city that works for everyone. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you for listening. I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you.